Well, thank you for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor. Our webinar today is on the opioid crisis and the labor market, and really our focus is going to be on the broader overdose crisis, so not, not just opioids, and its connections with structural issues uh, here in the United States. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce our three presenters that we're going to hear from today. Uh, Shannon Monnet is the Learner Chair in Public Health Promotion and Population Health at Syracuse University and is also the Director of the Center for Policy Research. Anita Mukherjee is an economist and an assistant professor in the Department of Risk and Insurance at the Wisconsin School of Business here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Rourke O'Brien is an assistant professor of sociology at Yale. Um, all of our presenters are, uh, that are with us today are I IRP affiliates. And I'm just so grateful to each of you uh, for making the time to share your work with us today. So thanks for being here. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Office of the Assist Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their uh, support of the uh, IRP as the National Research Center on Poverty and Economic Mobility. Uh, that said, any positions expressed in today's webinar aren't necessarily those of ASPE or IRP. Uh, so we have an hour today, and we're going to spend about the first 45 minutes hearing from our presenters, and then we're going to turn to your questions for Q&A. Uh, so you can type those in to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar, and we also have chat enabled today, so you can totally feel free to participate in that way, um, and we'll try to engage in that way with you too. So uh, Dr. Monet, if you want to pull up your slides as we're kind of getting rolling here, um, I uh, and I will say that we'll be posting a uh, recording of the webinar. Uh, um, later this week. So keep an eye out for that in your email. And we're also going to share a link to the presenter's slides if those are useful to you. So uh, with that, um, Dr. Monin, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dave, for the uh, invitation to join IRP today. My role is to set the stage for today's discussion by presenting an overview of demographic and geographic trends and differences in drug overdoses. I am having trouble moving my slide. Let me see. There we go. So I'm going to give you the big picture takeaways up front, and there are three. Um, the first is that although opioids have been the main contributor to overdoses, and opioids are the focus of the panel, at least in terms of the title, the contributions of other drugs, namely cocaine and methamphetamine, have increased dramatically in recent years, really demonstrating that our problem is bigger than opioids. The second is that while the U.S. drug overdose crisis is commonly described as a national crisis that affects all groups and all geographic areas, overdose rates are much higher and have increased much more in some groups in some places than others. And I think understanding which groups have the highest rates and which places have the highest rates can help us help clue us in to the underlying causes. And finally, there's plenty of evidence to show that both supply and demand factors have collectively contributed to the overdose crisis and to demographic and geographic variation in the severity of the crisis. They shouldn't be viewed as competing explanations. Instead, the way I look at the drug overdose crisis is as a perfect storm of the flooding of the market with highly addictive and potent substances, along with underlying population level vulnerabilities that were created at least in some part by changing economic conditions and labor markets. The U.S. is now in the third decade of a devastating drug overdose crisis that has claimed over one million lives since 1999 and shows no signs of abating. Increases actually began in the early 90s, uh, but they accelerated between the late 90s and mid 2000s and then rose even more rapidly throughout the late 2010s and early 2020s. This chart shows trends in deaths involving specific types of drugs. Specific types of opioids are shown in the three red lines broken down by synthetic opioids uh, or fentanyl, uh, heroin and prescription opioids. I also show overdoses involving cocaine, psychostimulants with abuse potential, which is methamphetamine, and prescription benzodiazepines. The primary contributor to the contemporary crisis has been opioids, but deaths involving cocaine, methamphetamine, and prescription benzodiazepines have also increased. Highlighting that our problem is, is bigger than opioids, methamphetamine deaths more than doubled between 2019 and 2021. And meth is now the second largest contributor to overdose deaths after fentanyl. 
What I want you to take away from this is that even though COVID has captured our attention, the drug overdose crisis remains a huge problem, but also that our problem is bigger than opioids. So I'm going to start by showing you trends in overdose rates by sex, race, ethnicity, and age group. These figures show trends uh, by age group and by race, ethnicity for males from 1999 to 2020. In the younger age groups here, whites and American Indians had the highest rates over the whole period. And rates in those two groups began increasing much earlier than rates among Blacks and Hispanics. In the middle age group, Black males had higher rates in the 2000s. Uh, rates for whites and American Indians surpassed those for Blacks in the early to mid 2010s, but by 2017, rates were higher among Blacks again. In the two older age groups, rates have been highest among Black adults for the whole, whole period, and we see especially large increases from the 2010s onward. This shows the same set of charts for females, and we see similar patterns in the younger age groups with consistently higher rates among American Indian and white women, followed by Black women. In the 45 to 54 year age group, American Indian women continue to have higher rates than the, the other groups. By 2020, rates for white and Black women had converged. In the older age groups, rates for Black women had caught up to and even surpassed rates, for, have surpassed rates for white women. Considering the two decades overall, from 1999 to 2010, the highest rates have been among American Indian males and females, ages 25 to 64, Black males, 35 to 64, Black females, 35 to 54, and white males and females, 25 to 54. Now, these are working age adults. So it really raises questions about why so many people in their prime working age years are turning to harmful substances. Now I'm gonna to turn to geographic differences. On the one hand, the US drug overdose crisis can be considered a national crisis given that overdose rates have increased nearly everywhere in the country over the past three decades. But on the other hand, drug overdoses aren't randomly distributed across the country. They actually vary pretty substantially across and within different regions and states and even counties. And I've long argued that understanding this variation is important because it helps us understand the underlying causes for the observed increases. A common narrative in the media about the overdose crisis a couple of years ago was that it had disproportionately affected rural communities. So headlines like these were painting a nearly monolithic picture of a rural America in crisis. This coverage certainly contributed much needed attention and resources to downtrodden rural areas, but it also misrepresented the geography of overdose deaths and ignored the heterogeneity and the severity of the problem across different rural areas. This shows trends in fatal overdose rates by metropolitan status. Here you can see the overdose rates were higher in non-metro counties overall, only in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Prior to that, rates were higher in metro counties. And since the emergence of fentanyl in the late 2010s, rates in metro counties have again surpassed those in non-metro counties. However, Broad metro versus non-metro classifications do obscure important differences across rural America. You take a look at these maps, which show fatal drug overdose rates at the county level from 2000 to 2020. And here you can see that some rural places have among the highest rates in the whole country, particularly Appalachia, the industrial Midwest, some of the desert Southwest. Meanwhile, other rural counties have among the lowest rates in the country, particularly the Mississippi Delta, the Great Plains, and parts of Texas. And so aggregating rural counties into a single rate averages out these large differences across these different rural regions and different economic contexts. The reality is that whether it's once vibrant manufacturing cities or we're talking about former coal country, what characterizes most of the places in the US with the highest overdose rates is not metropolitan status per se, but that they're places with a high degree of economic and social disadvantage and change. This figure shows the percentage differences in fatal overdose rates for a one standard deviation change in the predictor. And here we see that in addition to a supply factor, opioid prescribing, Factors that reflect economic and family disadvantage and concentrations of certain kinds of industries play really important roles. Overdose rates are higher in counties with more economic disadvantage, more vacant housing use units, more family breakdown, and in places where there's a higher share of jobs in mining and in retail and services. <clears throat> 
Rates are lower in counties with larger shares of employment in farming, fishing, and forestry, and manufacturing, finance, and professional occupations. And these aren't just current associations. In this paper and others, I show that economic disadvantage in 1980 and changes in labor markets since 1980 are associated with higher drug overdose rates in the 2000s and the 2010s. I think that McDowell County, West Virginia and Scioto County, Ohio are examples that epitomize many of the places with the highest drug overdose rates in the US. For several decades, McDowell County in West Virginia was the world's largest coal producer. It was a company town, a place where nearly all housing and stores and services were owned by the mining company that was also the main employer. When mines co closed, though, the population plummeted from nearly 100,000 people in 1950 to fewer than 19,000 people today. As the coal companies closed shop, those good paying mining jobs were replaced with lower paying service jobs as the main source of employment. But even those have disappeared. In fact, Walmart couldn't even survive in McDowell County. It closed its doors in 2016. So left jobless and hopeless and with untreated physical and psychological pain, many remaining residents turned to drugs and alcohol to cope. McDowell was really one of the canaries in the proverbial coal mine with opioid overdoses surging there long before the rest of the country was paying any attention to opioids and it still has among the highest fatal drug overdose rates in the U.S. Turning to Scioto County, in his book Dreamland, which raised alarms about the nation's overdose crisis, Sam Quinones described Portsmouth, which is in Scioto County, as a place that was once known for making things with a once thriving manufacturing base anchored by shoe, steel, brickyard, atomic energy, and soda factories. By the 90s, those factories were long gone and they were replaced by big box stores, check cashing and rent to own services, pawn shops, scrap yards. In today's Portsmouth, median household income is far lower than the national average. Poverty rates are high, disability and unemployment rates are high. At the time that Quinones published Dreamland, Portsmouth had the distinction of being the pill mill capital of America with more prescription opioids per capita than anywhere else in the country. Like McDowell, Scioto County still has among the highest overdose rates in the country, now driven primarily by fentanyl and methamphetamine rather than prescription opioids. Places like McDowell and Scioto were primed to be vulnerable to opioids, drugs that temporarily numb both physical and psychological pain. And thanks to lax federal and state policies related to pharmaceutical distribution, marketing, and monitoring, Pharmaceutical companies exploited that pain by targeting these places with overprescribing. When we think about the role of supply versus underlying vulnerability, it's important to understand that prescribing practices themselves were not place neutral. Pharma companies targeted among the most economically vulnerable places in the US, including Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia, before they moved across the rest of the country. And this overprescribing then created a market for heroin and fentanyl. These examples illustrate the role of macro level economic changes and policies in laying the groundwork for massive population health crisis. So to wrap up, we're now in the third decade of this crisis that has claimed over 1 million lives in the US and shows no signs of abating. The conditions that put people at risk of addiction and overdose are more prevalent in some places and some groups than others. Rates are notably higher in working age groups than in younger and older age groups and they're higher among American Indians, whites and blacks and among Hispanics and Asians. Most of the counties with the highest rates are in the heart of Appalachia, the industrial Midwest, uh, the desert Southwest, downtrodden places with multiple adverse health outcomes and high rates of premature mortality more generally. These counties are typically characterized by high levels of economic distress and family disintegration. Although opioids, particularly synthetic opioids, continue to be the largest contributor to drug overdoses in most groups and in most places, the role of other drugs, such as cocaine and methamphetamine, are also large and growing. So clearly our problem is bigger than one substance, it's bigger than opioids. The risk, I think, of focusing on a substance, 
is that policies and treatment interventions then focus on limiting supply of that specific substance or on developing and funding treatment and harm reduction approaches that are specific to that substance rather than addressing the underlying causes of widespread use and overdose, at least some of which are tied to the US policy environment, labor markets, and macroeconomic changes. I want to close by acknowledging my funders, including the National Institutes of Health and the USDA, and I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions later. I'll turn it back over to Dave now. Thank you so much, Dr. Monnet. And um, yeah, I just think that was so helpful in kind of laying the groundwork for what we're going to be talking about uh, for the rest of this hour today. Uh, Dr. Amanita Mukherjee, um, I'm going to invite you to uh, open up your slides there, and I'm going to turn it over to you, okay? You're still muted. Uh, there you go. Yes. Still always an issue. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. And I trust you can hear me and see my slides fine now. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, yeah, so today um, I'll be uh, uh, sharing with you some research on the effect of the opioid crisis on employment, um, looking really at transitions between different states of employment, as I'll discuss, but essentially we're thinking about transitions between unemployment, employment, and not being in the labor force and how that is affected um, by the opioid crisis. Um, so this is joint work with my colleague here, um, Daniel Sachs, and also a joint work with our graduate student in the economics department here, uh, Ho Young Yu. So the motivation for this project, and I think the reason why many of us are here is we recognize that this crisis is immense um, and it's higher in areas with employment declines. Um, there's also been in the most recent backdrop, a slow employment recovery from the Great Recession, which has been a bit of a puzzle for many um, labor economists and macroeconomists. And previous studies have looked at the effects of opioids and employment, right? We're not the first study to do this, certainly. We, we're, we view ourselves as building on a, a quite a large and, and robust literature here. Um, but our main contribution in this paper is to look at the effect of labor market flows. Um, so most studies look at something like the effect of um, some measure of the opioid crisis on the employment rate. Um, we are going to look at the effect on transitions, for example, from unemployment to employment and use those rates to back out effects on overall employment. And so the reason we think that's important is because these flows can generate um, uh, uh, effects on the broader employment rates, but with some delay that might not be easily captured if you just look at kind of instantaneous effects of crisis on outcomes. Um, so the research question we have is what is the effect of the opioid crisis on employment as measured through these flows? Um, the challenge, as you can imagine, is this reverse causality and common causes, right? In the sense that the opioid crisis maybe generates bad employment outcomes, but bad employment outcomes generate the opioid crisis. Um, both things can have common causes and in, um, in other uh, economic conditions and, and societal problems. Um, so how do we approach this problem uh, the solution that we propose is that we compare states that had different levels of the opioid crisis, you could argue somewhat randomly, um, stemming from pre-crisis prescribing regulations. So I'll talk about what those are um, in just a minute. So just here, I'll provide a little bit of background on these regulations that, that provide us with this quasi-random experiment um, that allows us to study the effect of the crisis on employment. Um, so five states, uh, California, Idaho, Texas, Illinois, and New York, um, were really unique in that they already had these prescribing regulations in place by um, really starting in 1939 all the way um, you know, throughout the decades, but they had it uh, particularly in 1996, which is important because that is the year that OxyContin, a very potent prescription opioid, was introduced. Um, so these regulations were already in there for different types of controlled substances that they applied to opioids. And what the triplicate regulation means is that a copy of the prescription had to be kept with the pharmacy, had to be kept with the doctor for at least five years, and had to be filed with the state, um, usually a state auditing agency that would record how frequently different prescribed um, substances are, are being used. And so this was a huge deterrent, particularly to the maker of this blockbuster drug, OxyContin, as I'll show in some of the documents, 
um, the maker, Purdue Pharma, who I think you know we've heard about in the news is now being vilified quite a bit in the opioid crisis, um, they really just did not market this drug in states that had these triplicate laws. And so that generated very, very large differences in the evolution of the crisis, as I will show you, in these five states versus the rest of the US. Now, I'll just recognize here in the gray that the small number of states does mean that we have to be careful in our statistical analysis. So in the paper, um, if you're in a setting like this or if you're interested, um, we do uh, do sort of the tests that are required when you have a relatively small number of states um, that have the regulation you're interested to study. So this is just an example um, of, you know, showing you why these regulations mattered so much. This is from Purdue Pharma's internal documents where they show like in the first blue circle, you can see like this product should only be positioned to physicians in non-triplicate states and within these areas focusing on, you know, certain doctors. And recommendation number two, again, in, you know, to the, ad to the attitude of triplicate doctors towards these narcotics. Like we do not feel that any further research on OxyContin for non-cancer pain would be appropriate in states that had this protective regulation. So for this reason, because they really did not market this drug in these states, um, those states ended up having many fewer um, opioid deaths and opioid prescribing. And so this chart is showing you that. And, and by the way, I should mention, you know, it's in, in the citations, but really a lot of this um, part of our work is leaning on a uh, very recent work by Abby Alpert, Bill Evans, Ethan Lieber, and David Powell, and in a recent paper of theirs called The Origins of the Opioid Crisis and Its Enduring Impacts. Um, the triplicate regulations have this large and protective effect over opioid prescribing. This is from their paper. And essentially, you know, the, the prescribing is not shown here, but triplicate states had 50% less opioid prescribing. And then what this chart shows in the blue is that they also had 36% fewer opioid deaths. Now, the vertical line shows you in 1996 when... Um, when this OxyContin was introduced. And you see that really that's where the trend breaks between the triplicate states and the non-triplicate states. And just, you know, as, as was just mentioned, keep in mind that this time frame we're looking at, there is a changing nature of opioid abuse where we have a rapidly increasing prescription drug use um, that switches to heroin that is now sort of in the synthetic opioids um, space. So what is our, our overall hypothesis and model in this paper? Um, the hypothesis in plain words is that opioid use and availability are more dangerous for those unemployed or non-employed as there's a greater danger of slipping into addiction, right? And so this is something that has been our hypothesis based on prior literature showing that during times of economic downturn, people can be more vulnerable um, to these types of behaviors. Now, certainly there's also research showing that during times of recession, people may get healthier, people may, may do good things, but there's also a parallel danger um, for some people of slipping into addiction. And so you might hear about these as deaths of despair, where we think about long run economic declines um, leading to um, vulnerability and addiction and suicide. Um, there's the Unemployment Opioid Use Association or a Pain and Unemployment Association, where if you're in pain, you may not be able to continue working. Um, and then there's also maybe, uh, you know, from the economics perspective, some rational addiction theory, which says that, you know, when you are in a state where you may not um, be employed or your long run prospects are generally bleak, being addicted or neglecting your health, maybe um, the cost of that is lower. Um, when anyways, you're not working. But all in all, what this shows is that opioids may affect employment, not just directly um, by, you know, affecting the, the general economic environment, but particularly by slowing the return of unemployment to employment. So basically, if you're unemployed, and then you fall into addiction, it will be harder for you to get reemployed. And it may also be harder for firms then to find people to hire um, who are not addicted or facing vulnerabilities that might affect their performance. So I won't go into all the details of our, our model here, but just sort of the highlights as we think about them, the three circles here, these are the states that we have in our paper, right? The employment state, unemployment state, and not in labor force state. Not in labor force, we think about as people who are not even looking for a job right now, right? That's the, that's the definition. Um, or it could be they're not able to look for a job right now. Um, and so between these three states that one could be in, you can think about the six different arrows, right? The transitions, how many people are going from un 
unemployed to employed, employed to not in the labor force. Maybe they, um, they don't even bother looking for a new job. They go directly from employment to not in labor force and so forth, right? And so what do we expect opioids to do? I'll just focus on the first out of the four here. Really, the main thing we expect it to do is to reduce this flow, um, which keeps the economy healthy, of reemployment, particularly from unemployment, right? We think that addiction might keep people in this state for a long time of unemployment because they are struggling to find jobs or they're maybe not able to look enough um, for those jobs. And so just as the preview of the results, um, you know, the, the graphical preview, so to speak, um, what we find, and this, this chart is showing you at, um, on the y-axis, the, the flow from unemployment to employment. What we see is that prior to OxyContin and prior to kind of the years after OxyContin, triplicate states actually had a much higher, um, sorry, lower outflow from unemployment, meaning that people unemployed in these states were not going back into employment at equally high rates. The gap is pretty large. So in a way, triplicate states were worse in employment recovery than non-triplicate states. But we see that after 2001, this really, this gap goes away, right? And so this is really the what's driving a lot of the results that I'll show you in the next slide, that in these triplicate states, and we think, you know, because of this somewhat random um, nature of these triplicate regulations being enforced when OxyContin happened to be introduced, we believe that this, um, these prescribing regulations are responsible for tightening this gap, right? And so what does this gap tightening mean? It means that in triplicate states, people had a an improved ability to exit unemployment, and that in non-triplicate states, people had a reduced ability to exit unemployment. And so in the paper, we go through all the different flows. I just showed you one of them, but we do the six comprehensive flows, and we use those flows to then go ahead and try and make statements about the overall state of the economy. So the overall employment to population rate, unemployment to population rate, and not in labor force to population rate. Those are the three columns here. And the one that I boxed is I think really the primary takeaway from this paper, which is that the effect of triplicate status on steady state employment is a full 1.11 percentage point. And that's off a base of about 67.8%. So it's quite a large effect when we think about just the effect of opioids. Um, and, you know, of course, there's effects as a reduction in unemployment. Where, where is this increase in employment coming from? It's coming roughly equally, you could say, maybe a little bit more from reductions in unemployment, but also coming from reductions in not being in the labor force. What I had in gray below is just the disentangling of this effect over time, where we see a lot of the effect, as you saw in the chart, is coming from the more recent time periods, right? Really when the, the overdose crisis switched to heroin. And so kind of thinking about OxyContin, the prescribing role in this, what, what the literature shows is that people may start with OxyContin or prescription drug, um, pres prescription opioids, but that may make them vulnerable to then falling into illicit substitutes like heroin. And so how long does it take for these affected labor transitions to show up in the employment level our estimates show that it's about two years, right? At about 24 months is when we see kind of the new employment level being reached. And so what we like about our paper is that it gives us some prospective kind of analysis based on current transitions. Like a lot of these monthly transitions going on um, at, the, at the individual level will help us foreshadow what will happen to the employment rate um, our analysis says in about two years. And that's what we think our paper contributes on top of the current literature, which has done similar analysis, but really just looking at the contemporaneous effects of opioid crisis on employment. And so just to conclude, um, you know, we find that after OxyContin's introduction, states with these protective laws had a relative increase in the job finding rate. So this increase in this unemployment to employment flow, um, relative decrease in the job exit rate. So people basically getting fired or laid off. Um, and then especially 
uh, post 2000 when opioid abuse was most severe. Um, and then triplicate regulation increased the employment rate by a full percentage point. And we think this paper shows this important connection that really all of our work here today is showing between opioid abuse and labor market outcomes, right? It, this may make it harder for people to exit unemployment and unemployment itself might trigger um, opioid abuse, especially if you're in an environment where there is a high opioid availability through no fault of your own. And so we think also that um, the gradual adjustment may make these um, effects difficult to detect in sort of contemporaneous analysis, um, which is why we, we hope that our, our work on the flows uh, contributes something um, to this very uh, deep and, and exciting uh, work. So thank you for your attention. I will stop here. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. Um, Rock O'Brien, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to invite you to turn uh, pull up your slides. And thanks so much for being here. Great, thanks so much. Hopefully you can see my slides. Um, thanks, Dave, for the invitation and to IRP for the invitation to speak with you today on this important topic. Um, it's wonderful to be joined uh, in this conversation with Shannon and Anita. Um, Anita's presentation just a few moments ago um, uh, discussed the relationship of the um, impact of the opi opioid crisis on employment. I'm actually going to take the other side of, of that question and, and talk about the relationship between changing employment patterns on opioid overdose mortality. Um, so before I do that, though, I just wanted to uh, step back for a moment and, and discuss for a moment why we think labor markets might impact uh, opioid overdose mortality in the first place. Um, so the work I'm going to share with you today is part of a larger research program uh, that aims to make the empirical case that economic opportunity is a major determinant of population health trends in the United States. Um, so this is part of a large research program um, headed up by my colleague and friend, Athene Venkataramani at Penn Medicine. Um, the website there is opportunityforhealth.org if you want to kind of uh, uh, see uh, more about our work. Uh, but broadly, we think about the relationship the economic opportunity and health is operating through a few different pathways, as you'll see on your screen. Um, so the first uh, most obvious one, right, is through improved socioeconomic status. So if people are exposed to communities um, with greater economic opportunity, then that might translate into um, higher incomes and wealth, which we know, of course, has positive health effects. Um, another pathway, though, up at the top is returns to human capital investment. So if you're growing up in, uh, in a community where you see uh, a lot of potential for you to climb the economic ladder as you grow up, that might lead you to, say, uh, invest more in your own education, say, finish high school, enroll in college. Um, and that, in turn, we know might have consequences for uh, positive consequences for your health down the road. Uh, and then this third pathway, right, is hope and aspirations. Uh, and this is a little trickier to measure, but but we think it matters if you are raised um, uh, in an area uh, where you're exposed to the idea that uh, uh, you have a lot of opportunities in life, that if you just work hard, you will make it. Um, and that that might lead you to, say, uh, invest in your own health as a form of human capital, right? So maybe uh, avoid some of those risky health behaviors in adolescence uh, uh, and, and more generally kind of invest in your health as part of investing in the future. So these are the kind of the broad ways we think about how economic opportunity uh, might shape uh, uh, individual health uh, uh, and health behaviors. Okay, so then that leads us to ask them what, what drives economic opportunity. Um, so here again, in our lab, we take a, a pretty broad view here and that there are many different factors that contribute to um, economic, shaping up economic opportunity context for Americans. Um, so here we're just uh, on the screen, just uh, revealing kind of some of the uh, issues that we've been studying over the last several years, um, and we kind of bucket them in, in, in three large areas. Um, one, of course, is um, policy and policy environment and policy changes. So we can think about uh, labor market policies such as minimum wages um, and union um, membership. Um, we can also think about social safety net programs, right? The generosity uh, and availability of things like Medicaid and food stamps uh, and TANF and disability programs, et cetera. Um, then at the bottom, we also think about um, uh, different uh, aspects of structural racism, such as uh, mass incarceration, policing, residential segregation, um, which will have we think have independent effects on shaping opportunity structures, particularly for black and brown communities, which then translates into uh, differential health outcomes. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing um, um, mostly on this kind of middle section on structural changes in the economy. Um, uh, uh, and as uh, you're no doubt aware, our economy uh, and the composition of our labor markets has been changing rapidly over the last uh, uh, few decades. 
Uh, and we think that that's a major driver in a lot of the population health outcomes, uh, trends that we've been seeing uh, over the last few decades. Um, so, of course, if you were to kind of uh, uh, think about what is the largest uh, change that has taken place in the U.S. labor market over the last four decades, uh, it is without a doubt uh, deindustrialization. So, so since 1980, the share of workers employed in a goods producing industry, so here we're, that's another uh, phrase for just the manufacturing industry, uh, fell from 25% of all workers to just 10% over the four decades between 1980 and 2020. Um, so this is, of course, the result of multiple factors, including increase in foreign trade competition uh, from China and Mexico, uh, as well as technological advancements. Um, and so this is uh, uh, including the increase of automation via industrial robots on factory floors that have displaced uh, 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 workers in those uh, uh, manufacturing jobs. So the, the question that we've been interested in and, and in our lab recently is kind of what is the impact of this deindustrialization on population health? and specifically on opioid overdose deaths and other deaths of despair, as Shannon was uh, mentioning earlier. So there are a few different ways that we've been trying to uh, get at this question. Um, it, one study I want to share with you looked specifically at an acute shock to manufacturing employment uh, brought about by the closure of automotive assembly uh, uh, plants. Um, so these are typically large uh, manufacturing plants that employ a lot of people and tend to be the, the, the primary source of employment uh, for workers without a college degree in their respective communities. Um, so to, to analyze the effect of plant closures, we uh, compiled a list of all of the plants that were in operation uh, uh, in 19, uh, in, as of 1999, uh, and then kind of followed those communities through time uh, and to try to see what was the impact of uh, one of these plant closures on the local opioid overdose deaths, death rates. Uh, if we compare that community that had a plant close to a similar communities uh, that, that where the plant did not close, where the plant remained open and um, the employment rate was not affected. Uh, uh, and so what we find um, uh, is, a, is a pretty dramatic effect. So in those communities where uh, a plant closed, five years after the plant closing, we see uh, opioid overdose uh, ret, uh, rates of 8.6 deaths per 100,000 um, uh, persons higher. Uh, relative to those communities where uh, the plant stayed uh, 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 open during this time period. So that's about an 85% relative increase in overdose deaths, which is um, a pretty stunning finding, but also makes sense uh, uh, if we think about the kind of downstream consequences of losing this vital source of employment for communities. And then when we dig a little deeper into the data, we see that that, that largest increase was for white men of working age, right, which is exactly the population we would expect to be most impacted by uh, a, a plant closing in these communities. So this gives us some evidence of an acute shock um, uh, uh, where an actual plant closes and kind of devastates the employment prospects uh, for a local community. But we're also interested in this kind of long-term secular trends uh, in the decline of manufacturing employment. Uh, and so here we turn to study two, uh, where we're interested specifically in the decline of manufacturing employment that's being driven by this increase in automation. Um, so there are lots of types of automation that we can talk about, um, but here we're thinking specifically about uh, the arrival of these robotic arms uh, uh, on the picture on the left here. So not that cyborg feature, but actually the kind of arms there um, that can be uh, reprogrammable to do many different functions on factory floors. Uh, uh, and there's uh, excellent evidence from um, a series of papers uh, uh, published in economics that show that the arrival of these um, uh, industrial robots uh, directly displaced many, many workers uh, uh, in, um, it, it, that formerly worked doing these jobs on plant floors. So over just the short 15 year period between 93 and 2007, the United States saw a fourfold increase in the number of industrial robots. Uh, and estimates suggest this led to the loss of between 400,000 to 750,000 jobs uh, in manufacturing as well as in the service sectors. Because we can think about um, when robots arrive, they displace the manufacturing workers. That in turn has depressive effects on the, the, on the entire local community. And so there are knock-on consequences for the service sector as well. Um, so we know there are pretty dramatic uh, uh, impacts of the arrival of these robots on uh, uh, employment, specifically manufacturing jobs. So then we wanted to know, okay, well, can we trace that through to see an impact on uh, working age mortality? 
Uh, so to do that, um, what we do is we leverage kind of the spatial variation uh, in automation. So don't worry too much about uh, uh, the scale here, but you can see in the darker red colors, those are communities where given the mix and the type of manufacturing that they did at the start of our study period, we would expect them to be um, uh, 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 more likely to be exposed to increasing automation relative to some of the, the, the lighter shades uh, uh, on the map. Uh, no surprise here, we see that some of the darkest uh, penetration is in um, on the industrial uh, Midwest, the uh, kind of old industrial Northeast, um, but it's not just there, right? So there are pockets of the South and even the far West uh, uh, where the, the arrival of robots had a large impact on unemployment. So we're gonna be leveraging this variation to try to see again, what are the knock-on consequences uh, uh, for mortality overall, but also specifically for um, uh, drug overdose mortality. So here I'm just pro uh, providing a, a brief snapshot of our findings from that paper. Um, here we break down um, mortality uh, for men of different age groups. Um, and in the top line is the all-cause mortality. So this is from uh, uh, all factors. Uh, and then we also are showing um, two of the main drivers, so drug overdose mortality and suicide mortality. Uh, and we see across uh, uh, all four age groups, so men of, of all parts of working age from 20 to 64, um, that we do have a, a positive and statistically significant effect of the arrival of, of these industrial robots on drug overdose mortality. Um, that in turn seems to be driving uh, a, a significant effect in overall mortality for men in this kind of critical age of 45 to 54. Um, uh -huh. And we find that for, if we add this all up, that, that this increase in automation can account for about 12% of, of the uptick uh, in drug overdose mortality in our study population over this period. So uh, a, a pretty substantial effect. So this is for males, and I'm gonna show the, the same set of slides for females. Uh, here again, uh, we see a very, very similar pattern um, where we uh, reveal positive effects on all-cause co all mortality for some age groups, uh, and some suggested evidence that that's being driven, again, in part by increase in drug overdose mortality. Um, I should say the scales aren't on these maps, but uh, on these figures, but for females, right, this, uh, the overall effects uh, uh, is a bit, is quite a bit smaller than for males, as we'd expect, given that uh, uh, men tend to dominate manufacturing employment jobs where uh, automation uh, uh, is displacing workers. So of course, the United States is a very large and heterogeneous country. So we wanted to then probe a little deeper and try to see uh, how does this relationship between automation and mortality vary across policy contexts? Uh, as we know, in the 50 states, they are uh, kind of 50, 50 different social safety nets and 50 different sets of labor market policies. So I should say, whereas the previous slides, we feel, feel pretty confident about those causal estimates, this is more correlational or associational. We, we're just kind of trying to see if uh, uh, some of these trends moderate as we might expect. Uh, and so just to quickly tick through here, uh, we do find that um, the effect of automation on drug overdose and suicide mortality uh, is greater in states with less generous Medicaid programs. So that suggests that Medicaid program generosity might have a bit of a buffering effect on this relationship. Uh, we also see that unemployment insurance uh, generosity uh, seems to mitigate the effect on suicide mortality. Uh, and then switching to labor market policies, we find the effect of automation on suicide mortality is lower in states with higher minimum wages. Uh, and the effect on drug overdose mortality is higher in right to work states, right? Where it is more difficult to, uh, uh, for workers to form a union. Uh, and finally, of course, going back to kind of where Shannon started with this kind of, with this uh, um, competing contributions of the supply and demand uh, of opioids, uh, we find the effect of automation on drug overdose mortality is higher in areas with relatively uh, greater supply of prescription opioids per capita. Uh, and that makes uh, uh, good sense given some of the trends we discussed earlier. So there's a few key takeaways. Um, so we find that the decline of manufacturing employment increased mortality, particularly for working age men. Uh, and this is mainly through these deaths of despair, uh, particularly uh, uh, opioid and, and other drug overdoses, suicide, alcohol poisoning, et cetera. Uh, we, we find some suggestive evidence at the same time that, that safety net programs and labor market policies may blunt that impact, um, uh, as may, of course, efforts to reduce the supply uh, and accessibility of opioids. Uh, and more generally, we think this the study is part of a, a larger body of evidence we're building uh, that's making the case that economic opportunity is a critical determinant of population health. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over to Dave.
Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rourke. And if I can invite Shannon and Anita to turn on their cameras as well. Um, so as we're transitioning to Q&A here, um, I do just have want to have an announcement for the researchers in the audience. Um, just is not planned, but IRP uh, has a call for applications out right now that is relevant to what we've been talking about today and among the sort of research areas that we are looking for uh, things on. Um, we're uh, research that looks at integrating substance use services and human services programs. Uh, it was one of the areas that they're, so I'm going to post a link to that right now as folks type in their questions for us, and, uh, and then we'll turn to that. So, um, but as, as we get started here, uh, you know, it seems like one of the major themes is is that uh, you know so much of this varies by policy context and and by location. And uh, you know, one question I have is just you know outside of the U.S., how does how does sort of the U.S. picture compare to what we see internationally? Um, and I know we didn't really talk about that a little bit, but can it you know are, are we seeing anything that that compares to this in places outside the U.S.? Dr. Maya, do you do you have a sense of that? I'm not sure if I'm the best one to answer that okay. question. I mean, I, I okay. think that we are somewhat unique in the magnitude of the overdose problem here in the U.S. It's certainly the case that other countries have issues with sub substance misuse and, and rates of overdose have been increasing in parts of Europe, Canada, certainly. Um, but we do seem to be an outlier in the overall severity of the crisis. And I would say in relation to, to Rourke's presentation, um, what distinguishes the U.S. relative to, say, our high-income peer countries is that we have a, le a less robust social safety net than those other countries. So, you know, it's not that they haven't experienced uh, similar types of economic change and, and even decline and in, in similar types of social change, but as Rourke's analysis suggests, safety nets can buffer against that economic downturn and that economic change. And we just don't have the same level here in the U.S. to protect our population when those changes happen. Okay. Rucker, Anita, did you, either of you had anything you want to add to that? I think just one thing I'll add, having worked a bit on harm reduction, is that I think uh, Europe has been, I think, more modern in its approach to a lot of the harm reduction in terms of having safe places for injection sites and heroin consumption where people can, you know, it's it's less about let's completely ban these things, but more about let's have, let's sort of deal with addiction as it is. And I think there's places in North America that are like Vancouver and I think in San Francisco, there's been experiments with that, but that may be part of what makes the crisis uh, worse here is that we generally don't have those types of facilities. Thank you. Um, actually, I need a, a second question for you here. So uh, this is from Mary. And can you comment on the relative importance of job finding transitions versus job separation transitions in explaining the sort of advantage that uh, in the employment to population ratio in triplicate states? So I will answer that in one second. I think, Rourke, you want to say something. Let me just. Oh, you did. Table. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I was just gonna—I was just gonna echo uh, Shannon's. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. No worries at all. Just that I, I do think that you know it's hard to even underestimate the difference between the U.S. and some of our high-income countries in in not only the strength of the safety net, but also um, uh, these labor market institutions, these labor market policies. So the the job quality, right? So conditional on getting a job, it tends to come with a higher wage and, and other benefits and protections in those countries than in the U.S., right? So I think that you know, for many low-income Americans, you know, obviously employment is an critical first step, but the quality of those jobs really matters. And so when the good jobs disappear, if they're replaced by bad jobs, uh, you know, that's one reason why we might still see worsening health trends. Okay. Yeah. And, and for us, I think I'm looking, you know, so if you look at the paper, we do all six of the transitions and we don't really take a huge stand on which one's most important because all of them are ingredients in this model to get to the, the overall employment rate. But looking at our charts, there is, I think, I think the greatest impact is definitely from the unemployment to employment, so the job finding rate, um, but the employment to not in labor force rate is also an area where triplicate regulation seems to protect people from not going directly to not in labor force, but rather going from employment to unemployment. Um, so I, I hope that helps answer your question. Again, 
Okay. Um, so we've got a question uh, about, you know, someone who has kind of uh, lived through a lot of the steel mill closures, uh, Southwest Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, and, um, yeah, her question is, you know, like automation is probably not going away. And, and when large scale industry does come back in some ways, it is so automated that there are just many jobs, like that there are far fewer jobs available. You know, so how do you develop labor market policies that maybe can offer us more hope and your work? Would you start us off with that? Yeah, it's a really difficult question, but I, I think part of the answer comes in just recentering place in the way that we think about social policies and social investments um, at all levels, but particularly when we think about the role of the federal government, um, right? Uh, beyond, you know, things like minimum wage and, 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 and uh, unionization and, and these other things we know work, uh, it's important that we're we're quite thoughtful about locating, um, uh, uh, you know, federal investments, the, the locations of, you know, everything from Navy bases to research centers, this, that, and the other, into communities that we know have been devastated by by these trends that are entirely outside of their control. Um, I think for a while there was the, there was this hope or belief that 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 you could just retrain everybody or you could just have everybody move to a better place, but. I think we, we need to come to terms with the idea that place matters. People have personal history and connection to places. And so we need to be thoughtful uh, um, and do an audit of, of all of our social poli social economic policies to really try to center place uh, uh, and not blame towns and communities for failing to track private sector investment, which I think is sometimes the narrative, and instead uh, see them as uh, you know victims of these trends that are kind of far outside of their control. Okay. Shannon or Anita, did either of you have anything you wanted to add there? I think he's covered it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so we, we've got a couple questions um, sort of asking about, uh, you know, sort of the employer role in 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 this. You know, what are are there are any is there are there any things that employers are doing to help people that may be struggling with some of these issues or um, services that employers are offering in some of these places that seem to be making a difference? And is that is that is that a thing? I'm just going to leave that open in case anybody wants to say yeah, yeah, you're. I mean, there may be some somebody from the audience who um, who knows. I'm not aware. I have looked a lot. I have to say, um, maybe it was a year ago, so maybe something very recent has popped up. But at least I, I didn't find a lot in terms of employers fully recognizing and supporting employees with addiction problems or who are facing opiate abuse. Now there's, I think, counseling on like, the best I found was some counseling on patient health. So like if you're prescribed prescription opioids to try and understand how to manage them, particularly in a job that's physically demanding. Um, there were some like seminars at a few employers that I looked at on how to manage that chronic pain. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, if um, anyone else has more to offer. Okay, well- um, Second uh, chance employers, yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And feel free to add that to the chat if, uh, if you know any examples there that we can talk about. So, um, and okay. So uh, here's a question for Rourke. Do we know anything about who within the at-risk population is sort of better able to navigate these economic changes and maybe be less likely to be caught up in substance use? And, and I, you know, I know Shannon and Anita probably have thoughts on this too. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I don't, um, I'm not aware of, of um, studies that, that that point to good evidence on this front, perhaps Shannon or, and Anita are. Um, I do think though that this idea of resilience um, is something that our lab is trying to think about uh, quite a bit now. And so we think about that at multiple level. Um, so not just, um, of course, people, we can think about, you know, why are some people able to withstand these economic shocks and, and, and still find uh, a pathway forward? You know, uh, are there ways that we can learn from those individuals and, and, and use it to think about kind of more innovative interventions that try to help people um, think more positively about the future? Uh, uh, and so they kind of invest in their human capital in some ways. Uh, and then also think about, of course, back to my earlier comment about the resilience of places. How come some communities are able to bounce back? Is it because of diversified labor markets or is it smart policies or kind of what is it? So um, I don't have the answers now, but I do think kind of thinking about resilience is going to be uh, key as we move forward. I can weigh in a little bit on this. Um, I've, I've been part of a research team led by folks from uh, University of Iowa and, and Iowa State University, uh, David Peters in particular, uh, where we tried to understand why some places that 
based on all of their markers of economic disadvantage, should have really high overdose rates, but don't. Um, and so we we picked a couple as case studies, and, and they traveled to these places and looked around, chatted with all kinds of different stakeholders in these communities. And, and what they kind of took away is that the places that seem to be doing better, um, these so-called resilient places, have some cheerleaders in them, right? Some people who are really kind of taking the lead at, at bringing groups together to enact different activities and community events and other sorts of infrastructure that can help to address this, this problem. And that the places that don't do that, that are you know at risk and also really fall into some pretty bad trends are places where the, the law enforcement has just stigmatized uh, to a high degree people who, who use substances and continue to long the same old fashioned approach of, of locking people up and kind of throwing away the key. So two very different approaches where one type of community understands that um, we're, we're kind of in dire straits here and, and increasing stigma in these populations isn't going to be very effective to, to dealing with the problem compared to those that use the same approach of, of mass incarceration. At the individual level, uh, one of the things that I've often thought about is like, what's at the, the foundation or the core of addiction? And, you know, I think um, one of those things is, that's at the foundation is lack of connection and lack of meaning and purpose in life. And so what brings us meaning and purpose in life? What are the reasons we get out of bed in the morning? Well, our job might be one of them. And that's why labor markets came to seem to keep popping as, as one of the things that matter, especially in the U.S., our jobs bring us a lot of identity. And so when you lose that, you know, do you have something else in your life that can bring you meaning and purpose? For some people, that might be a family uh, and, uh, you know, a, a social network system that can be the reason that you get out of bed in the morning and that you don't don't use drugs. For others, that might be involvement in different uh, community activities. So one of the things that, that I find in kind of this associational correlational research is that places that have a, a large share of social capital promoting institutions, such as religious institutions, have lower rates, have, have lower overdose rates. Uh, and so I really think that those three things together, our work, our families, our communities, um, either it can put us at risk of, of addiction or can help buffer against it in the loss of one or another of those things. Anita? No, I think, um, you know, it, it does seem to just cut across all demographics. I think in my research, I did find as I think consistent with works work that occupations that are physically demanding, like people in those jobs appear to be more vulnerable. But other than that, I mean, there's and of course, differences, but nothing kind of striking that that I found. Okay. You know, we, we had a question that I thought was really interesting. Uh, you know, we were framing this webinar in terms of uh, labor market and have mostly been talking about adults and working age. But, you know, with um, the some of these same sort of issues have kind of come up uh, in youth, and we've seen that rising, especially in the last few years. Do do those sort of patterns map on to what we've seen here in the places that you've uh, been looking at? I mean, Shannon, do you do you have a sense of that? Could you maybe rephrase the question? I'm not. Quite yeah, sure. sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean, what like do um. Do some of the youth mental health crises um, map on the same ways that we're seeing for some of the labor market things here in the, the research that you've seen? Oh, you know, I'm not sure. That's a really okay. good question. And I and I would hypothesize, yes. Uh, and I do know, I am aware of research that shows that in, place, in places that have kind of borne the brunt of the overdose crisis, we are seeing increases in youth mental health um, adverse impacts. So for example, suicide rates among um, adolescents are higher in places that have experienced most of the increases in drug overdose over the last several years. And so, you know, like, what are the mechanisms? Is it is it the drug problem in that community that is leading to family disintegration that then is leading to adverse mental health outcomes? Or is it that the characteristics that drive the increases in drug overdose are also driving the kind of um, declines in mental health among adolescents in these areas. I think that's the thing that we still have to tease apart. Um, 
Yeah, and I want to echo uh, Anita in the chat. Just thank everyone for that provided examples there. So, uh, you know, we are close to out of time, but I, I want to give each of our presenters sort of an opportunity to sort of offer a final thought, you know, things that you're uh, looking towards, things that you're paying attention to um, in, in your research as uh, looking forward here. Um, Rourke, would you, would you start us off? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I think our lab right now is really focused on trying to think about this resilience question and trying to think, you know, beyond these kind of policy or kind of material-based outcomes, how are ways that we can try to understand the way people see their own future, their own life trajectory, uh, uh, and try to provide kind of that just-in-time intervention to try to uh, help encourage people to kind of take these kind of longer term views in their life that there are opportunities, perhaps, you know, uh, hopefully where they live, perhaps elsewhere, right, to try to catch these people at these kind of critical life moments, right, as they're finishing high school or starting adulthood, uh, when they're making a lot of these really important decisions that are going to impact their entire life. So, so trying to be kind of creative and thinking about, yeah, how we do this kind of community and people to people centered approaches, in addition to all the kind of structural work we know we have to do. Okay, Anita? Yeah, I think I'm going to sort of entering currently another, you know, potentially big unemployment period. I think just thinking about how vulnerable that stage is for many individuals in terms of self-destructive behavior and how kind of this random exposure to opioid availability can, can be quite profound in shaping the whole life course. And so really trying to contain that and think about solutions for people to, you know, help, help be less vulnerable and that it's a continued problem. Okay, Shannon? I think it's important that we think about the drug overdose crisis, not in isolation, but in the context of broader population health problems in the United States. The United States performs poorly relative to our peer countries uh, on life expectancy more generally, and that's driven by multiple causes of death, including cardiovascular disease and alcohol-related diseases and suicide. And, and we've been sort of experiencing leveling off followed by some declines in our life expectancy in recent years that drug overdoses have played a large role in, but so have um, stagnations and things like cardiovascular disease and even increases in cardiovascular disease mortality in certain groups where it shouldn't be increasing, namely young adults. So we have to consider the broader context of population health, which involves the upstream federal and state policies and these macro level economic changes that are driving multiple outcomes simultaneously and not put all of our eggs into one health basket like here's the problem of the day we have a lot of problems of the day and given that there's not one driving uh thing that's causing mortality increases we need to think about our structural uh factors here in u.s society that are that are contributing to these unfortunate changes okay Shannon Monet, Anita Mukherjee, and Rourke O'Brien, thank you all so much for your time today, and thank you to everyone that joined us. Uh, again, we're going to send out a recording of this webinar along with copies of the slides tomorrow, so you can look for that in your email. Um, thanks to everyone.